We're live. We're live from from the safe place. We're live in face in the safe place on Facebook and the safe place in Decatur, Texas. Um, I hope you all are here with us today. Um, I've lost my ability to to invite people, so I can't invite anybody. So whoever shows up, shows up. Well, let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together today. I ask that you guide us through this time and uh, teach us the things you want us to see. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, it's been an exciting time here in Wise County. Um, COVID's passing by. And now we have people that are um, having riots and protests in our town. Well, we haven't had a riot yet, but hopefully we won't have any. Um, but protests. And that's always the thrill of it. Hey, Gary. Um, so here we are. We're in, we're in Acts chapter 17. I believe we start in verse... Um, what, 9? We're going to read the first verses of that chapter so we can catch up. <clears throat> so we'll be up to speed and, and we, be, we will be uh, doing this in context. Uh, the reason this is important is because so many people do teach out of context things. Where they just will teach um, snippets of stuff or out of order. And it's important for us to see whatever we see in a scripture comes in a sequential way. So it's important for us to, to do it that way so we can see things unfolding in the scriptures okay so starting in verse 1 now when, when they Paul Silas Timothy and Luke <coughs> passed through Amphipolis Amphipolis and Apollonia they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews remember we talked about how a synagogue of the Jews uh, a synagogue was like the word church is meant by God to be. It's people. Um, uh, later, by the time by the time Paul showed up in this place, um, and these guys showed up, the word synagogue was was synonymous with the uh, building in which the people met. And so, a lot of times, people now make the same mistake and refer to the church as a building, whereas it's really a spiritual building of people being built up by God. So there was a synagogue of the Jews. There was a, a group of Jewish people. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, is the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And the reason it was important, we talked about this last time on the time before, was that there were a number of different kinds of theories about whether Jesus would be a conquering king or a suffering servant. And the reality is, is that you can teach mostly out of Isaiah that he was both. Um, some people were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So, so what he's saying is some of the Jewish people in it that were part of the synagogue were persuaded that Jesus was Messiah. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and the devout Greeks are the Greeks that are worshiping in the Jewish style. And, and he mentions a number of the, uh, not a few, of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, the Jewish leaders, and in particular, the um, Jewish leaders, because that's what the Jews always um, refers to in here, they were not persuaded. So they didn't believe that the Jesus they were preaching was the Messiah. And they became envious, took, and they took some of the evil men in the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Now we wondered why Jason? Um, and, and um, the reason that they did that was they knew that Jason was housing this team that came from Antioch uh, prior to that from Jerusalem. 
And so um, they attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And so they wanted to find Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke and drag them out to the people. Well, they couldn't. When they couldn't find him, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren who were there to the rulers of the city. And they were crying out that these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, how do they know that? Well, someone from other places has come and, and followed them to Thessalonica. They said, they said, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. So, you know, guilt by association. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus, all of which was lies. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And so that's where we are now. It brings us up to verse 9. So when they had taken security from Jason, when they had taken security from Jason and the others, they let him go. That's Acts 17, verse 9. Jason and the others, what you would say today, posted Baal. But this wasn't Baal as we know it. Baal is typically money that someone gives the pledge that they'll be present at a trial. Now, since there wasn't any evidence to try them, there would be no trial. So what Jason and the rest did was put up money as assurance that they were promising to send Paul and Silas away. People who aren't saved, and strangely enough, many who are Christians, really believe that things like this will work. They truly believed that if earthly spiritual leaders like Paul and Silas were gone, this Christianity stuff would stop. They believed that. And then we see this happening in China, and we see it happening in many Muslim countries to this day. In China, they're, they frequently are arresting leaders of the body of Christ. And, and they figure that if they do that enough, these people will stop, but they are truly committed to Jesus. And it really doesn't matter to them. I'm told that they're always, um, they're always uh, teaching their replacement. And the same thing happens in Muslim countries. Now, I, knew, I knew someone that was living in Saudi Arabia and working for an oil company who were Americans and Brits and other first world people. And, and they were having church and homes because they couldn't have what they were used to seeing, which was church buildings. So they went back to, oh my goodness, the biblical model. And they were meeting in homes. And what would happen is eventually the local authorities would be watching them, the Muslims, and they would um, arrest or um, detain whoever was acting as the preacher for this group. And he'd say, well, you know, it's against the law here in, in Saudi for you to practice anything other than Islam. So we're going to have to deport you and send you back to, to America. But if you would, just let us know who your replacement is, and we'll tell him that he's supposed to step into your place. And in and, and that religion, it's considered, um, it's considered to be a righteous thing to lie to someone outside of that faith. And so they would lie. And then they would identify the replacement, and their replacement would get, would get deported too. The authorities are always arresting leaders, figuring that if the leader is gone, the rest will melt away. And they clearly don't understand how all this works. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the first half of the verse says this, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. So they kicked Paul and Silas out, basically. But Jesus remained behind as the real leader of the church there. 
Well, when, when I was um, a chaplain at the county jail in Houston, Texas, the Harris County Jail, the Lord gave me an image, and the image was, well, the congregation we were a part of at the time um, was was doing, um, was going to do cell church, which was, which was um, kind of like a, um, a type of house church model, but really they were using the institutional church kind of as a mothership, and they were going to put feelers out into different neighborhoods and try to grow the, the mothership, the, the main congregation, through cell church ministry, and also try to try to reclaim the impersonalness that is inherent in the institution. And, you know, because here with a thousand people in this congregation, it was 1,600, 1,800 people in two worship services. So um, about 800, one, 1,000, another. And you didn't know anybody, basically, unless, like, I was on staff. So, so I knew so. So they were going to do, they were going to do cell church. And when I learned, when, and I had started it under two other groups. And the Lord told me to build cell churches in literal jail cells so that's what we would do now in that circumstance <clears throat> in the county jail in Houston at the time <clears throat> excuse me a person <clears throat> would be in the jail for about it could could be held for two years and serve a two-year sentence there or well, once they might take a year a year and a half to go to trial and then maybe if they were convicted and sent to prison then, or if they were uh, found innocent, then they would be leaving that jail. Uh, sometimes they'd shuffle people around on the floor, but for the most part, those guys were in those cells um, the whole time, from the time they got arrested until the time either they were released or they were sent off to prison until they served their time. What I was doing was I was identifying natural leaders in that group and I was training them to be the spiritual leader in that group. But always find having them find who their replacement was going to be in case they got moved to another another cell or another floor or if they, you know, finished their time, if they went all the way out to the streets because they were done. And what we're trying to do was was like right now in the system, many people like in the regular church system, many people, the only time they get anything spiritual is the one to three hours a week that they're going to be in a church building. The rest of the time, not always. There, there are numbers of good ministers out there to keep up with the people. But most of the time, that's it. And there's absolutely no contact with other Christians many times, uh, except for when you go punch in and have a service and punch out when you're done. And, and I found that the same thing was true in the jail system. I'd come in, do my rounds, so people would get an experience with, because um, it was my floor, with me for as long as they wanted me to stand there and talk to them. And then uh, we'd have a church service once or twice a week. That was it. And and so what I was hoping was that Bible studies and, and uh, reading the scriptures to one another and singing, and doing that, the things that, that it says that happened in house churches in the first century would happen in those cells all the time. And, and some of them really did. But to do that, they had to find their replacement. But let's say they didn't. And whoever it was went off to the Texas Department of Corrections. And it's, it's like you would expect the whole thing would fall apart. But what would happen was that Christ in the people would step up and someone would step into that spot or some ones would step into that spot. So these guys, um, the leaders in this place and the Jewish leaders, um, bring this man Jason down. He gives security, basically saying that he and the brethren there are going to make sure Paul and Silas leave. The leaders heave a sigh of relief, the, the spiritual leaders of the Jews, and also the leaders of the town heave a sigh, a sigh of relief because now this crisis has passed. But Jesus himself dwells in each one of those Christians in bodily form 
and he's in them so even if the first Christians that came into town leave Jesus is still with them something for us to think about especially when some of us believe that there's going to be persecution wherever you live the United States, Canada, um, Europe that there will be persecution and we may have to go underground but what will happen is the church will continue it's been persecuted before and it survived so so in Acts 17.9 um, the leaders take security or basically pay off uh, from Jason and the rest and they let them go then the brethren immediately in verse uh, 10 of Acts 17 the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea when they arrived they went into the synagogue of the Jews so the leaders of the Jews in Thessalonica have them thrown out of town so they go right back into a similar situation the Christians in Thessalonica wasted no time in getting Paul and Silas out of town but they did wait until it was dark why'd they do that most likely it was to keep them safe from anyone who might want to ambush them and potentially harm them physically so having had a difficult time in this past time, town what did Paul and Silas do well they went to Berea and they did the very thing that got them booted out of Thessalonica you know, just over and over again as we do this study I can't I can't help but think about the guts of um, of these guys um, and uh, and and now we have opportunities in our culture to have the same kind of courage we have the same Holy Spirit living inside me He's still a comforter so they did the very same thing that got them kicked out of Thessalonica. They did, in fact, what they always did. They found the Jewish synagogue and they went on inside. Now there, there were different kind of people in this synagogue than in the one back in Thessalonica. These people were trained to love the scriptures, presumably more than they loved themselves or more than they love their earthly situation, or more than they love their station in life. This is what Luke wrote about them, Acts 17, 11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things were so. And so Paul and, and Silas went in and said the same thing, basically. You can imagine they said, um, you know, this Christ that I'm telling you about, this Jesus is the Christ. Um, and so they searched the scriptures daily. So every day that they were there, they were looking up, what does it say that in the Old Testament? That sort of thing. So in the, in the church I was born again, in the congregation I was born again in, back in Mandeville, Louisiana. I mean, early on, and we didn't even know about house church at the time, um, we had a house that had a big living room. Ever since that house, when we looked at a house to purchase, when we moved to Katy, Texas, and then we moved up here, when we bought a house, the main thing that mattered to us was that we would have a big meeting room. And of course, you know, I like to cook, Laurie cooks. We we wanted to have, you know, a decent kitchen and living areas and stuff. But, you know, place bedrooms and stuff. But but um but we wanted we knew that we were going to be gathering with our brothers and sisters in Christ in that place. Because in our very first congregation, which I think had about 80 people when we first moved there and by the time we left it was up to about 130 maybe um, on Friday nights we would invite the whole congregation to our house and often it'd be 50 or 60 people some of the people that view this Bible study uh, were part of that one was a lady named Beverly 
his last name starts with the V for Victor. Um, she was there, I and mean, she was the one that I was thinking about when I said that about the um, the searching the scriptures daily. We would be talking about anything, and she was so hungry for Bible study that she always had her Bible tucked down next to her, next to the arm of the chair she sat in. And someone would mention a topic, and if it was anywhere near anything Bible-related, she'd pull that Bible up and go, can we study it now? And that's what we would do, you know. And we would pull, we would pull it out, and people would start throwing scriptures out there. It was great. And so that was cool. Now, Gary says, one with 19 windows, now the house we're in now has something like 19 windows. It's, it's great. And when we meet, we often just leave the blinds open and just regular light from outside. So, Acts 17, 11, were those kind of people like Beverly. They were fair, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all readiness. And we're going to look at what all these things mean. Um, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether what Paul and Silas were saying was true. So they were more fair-minded. What does fair-minded mean? Well, it was a term that basically meant that one was descended from a good family or was of high rank. But metaphorically, it means noble-minded and generous. So these people were noble-minded and generous. Luke uses that term, or he used that term, because they practiced something that he admired great. They received the word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Actually, he lists two things that they practiced that mattered to him. The first is that they received the word with all readiness. And this has to do with two things. It has to do with the idea of them receiving and making the word their own. And a second was how it's received. So try the following experiment sometime. I did this for a while. The form of Christian gathering most common today has to do with people coming together to experience a lecture on a topic from a main speaker. Everything leads up to the sermon, so it's kind of like appetizers leave up, lead up to the sermon. And then there's the sermon, which is the main dish. And then that's followed by things leading to the end of the meeting, which is kind of like the after dinner mints. In this analogy, there is no dessert. But it kind of does that. It, it, it ramps up. Then there's the plateau, the main dish, which is the sermon. And then it ramps off at the end. Um, on the ramp off could be, you know, in the beginning it's announcements, praises, praise songs, or, or um, you know, songbook songs or whatever. And then um, maybe a collection, and maybe a special song or something, or a scripture reading. And then uh, announcements. And then there's the main dish, which is the sermon. So everything leads up to that sermon. And then afterwards, we like tidying up stuff. There might be other announcements. There might be our reminders. There might be some songs. There might be ministry time, which I always have enjoyed and appreciated, taking advantage of it for my own needs, but also spend a lot of time praying with people. So that's that's the if you look at most church services, if in the order of worship, that's what it's going to look like. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, you know. And, we're supposed to do things decently in order. But that's basically it. But my main point for bringing this up was that the sermon it seems to be the purpose. And, and people choose congregations by the quality of the sermon, sometimes by the length of the sermon. Some people like real short ones so they can rush off to, to the fellowship meal or they can rush off to the buffet someplace. Um, some people like long ones because they, they believe... Some you know people are hungry to be taught, and if that's the only way they're going to get it, then they're going to enjoy that. Um, but curiously, you know, I started looking at that idea, and I, I was unable to find the word sermon anywhere in the Bible in any translation of Bible, and that kind of surprised me. 
Now, while there were some occasional special speeches and teachings in the Bible, the entire concept of a sermon is something that was added to Christian, Christianity after it was institutionalized, as it began to take on more and more of the world than the world system. Um, then sermons came to exist, and pulpits and raised platforms and, and church buildings and all that kind of stuff came in. Um, so the experiment. So try this experiment sometime. The experiment goes like this. Some Monday, ask as many people as you know went to church the day before. Ask them if they went to church the day before. And if they say they did, ask them to tell you what the guy talked about without looking at their notes and their in a program or their order of worship or whatever they call it. Ask them if they went to church yesterday on a Monday and what did the guy talk about. Now I tried this for a year once. 98% of the people could not tell me what the sermon was about just the day before. 24 hours or less. They couldn't tell you. Imagine how few could remember that sermon a week later. Yet, it was meant by a well-intentioned and well-educated minister, and often, you know, a lot, some of them don't know the scriptures at all, but, but uh, a lot, most of them have been trained, most of them are well-educated, and most of them spend lots of hours preparing those sermons. And that was meant by a well-intentioned, well-educated, well-prepared minister to equip the people for their everyday lives. And 24 hours later, 98% of them couldn't tell me what was happening or what they had heard or even what the topic was or anything general, you know. Operating in the smaller and more intimate setting of meeting in homes, I've noticed that people tend to hold on a lot longer to the things that were taught by any of the attendees because we don't have an identified speaker most of the time. I mean, if you come visit us, the Lord might ask me to, to, to ask you to, to have a teaching for us or a word from us because we're, we're not going to get a chance to see you all the time. And so we're going to honor the fact that God sent you to visit with us. But I don't generally have a teaching anymore. Sometimes I give something, but for the most part, it's everybody. Like like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, some have a word, some have an uh, ex exhortation, some have a song, some have a song, some have a teaching. And so um, what we found is that um, in that kind of intimate setting, people held on to what was taught by anybody a lot longer. People would talk about like like um, just ideas that were brought up or conversations that we had or songs that we sang. The form that was practiced in early church, this form seems to better facilitate retention, but in either form of, of meeting, whether it be in a big building or a small building or in someone's home, which is a building, um, it always comes down to whether or not a Christian is interested in actively absorbing whatever equipping God intends for them. Luke said that the people in Berea received the word with all readiness. And the word received means that they actively seized the word because they wanted it for themselves. The term with all readiness means that they were predisposed or ready to do so. This was an attitude at work in them, and Luke said that it made them noble in his eyes. Now one thing I have noticed in the institutional type setting is that often the people are encouraged to come expecting to hear something or to receive something. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, I believe that, you know, when we send when we send out our invites to come to our thing, um, we we um, generally encourage someone to bring something. 
not just potato salad or, or coleslaw or something, but a teaching. Like if the Lord's giving you something, often someone will come in and tell me, I have something tonight. And, and that tells me not to forget to call on them because uh, I'm, I'm not running a meeting, but I'm facilitating. And, and so they do. But um, so we're telling them we expect that somebody's going to get something. Uh, so they're praying and they're asking God for something like that. And a lot of minister friends of mine will um, will encourage the people to come expecting to um, receive something. Come come ready, be in all readiness. In other words, like it says right here in Acts 17, hey, they received the word with all readiness. And then on through the verse. Um, he says, and search the, the scriptures daily to find out uh, whether these things were so. Paul found that to be no, a noble trait. We can translate this idea we can translate this idea to the present time. Are we expecting that God will meet us and touch us on a regular basis? Do we actually do we wake up this morning hoping that God would bring something to us to share something with us or would draw us to him for something? Are we ready to do that on a regular basis? If so, we live in all readiness, like like it says in there, like they receive the word with all readiness. If we do that, if we have that expectation and that, and that anticipation that God's going to speak to us at our job and mine at the store, wherever we are, dead still in traffic in one of the big cities that we don't live in here, um, then we'll be in all readiness. And if we do, when the Lord speaks to us through someone we don't even entertain what they say, if we don't, if we don't come in readiness when he speaks to us, we won't even entertain what they say. Or if we do, we will. We won't do what they did in Berea as they search the scriptures daily. And when you think about it, if we're not in our readiness, it's because we already think we got what we need. And if if we think we know it all, then why bother? And that's what, what happens. What happens is we come in not in pissed, anticipating what God says he's going to do. In Philippians 1, six, he says God's going to complete what he began in you in Christ Jesus. What's that look like? It, it means that he's going to bring stuff to us that's outside of us that he wants inside of us. He wants us to receive. And if we're not ready for that, if we don't approach it with all readiness, then it'll go right past us. If we ever come to the belief that we have somehow arrived spiritually, we cease to be in all readiness. And if we do, when the Lord speaks to us, we won't grab it at all. I would like to seek God. I want to live with all readiness. Every time... I tell you, I'm constantly amazed at the Word of God. I've taught the book of Acts, this book of the Bible, several times now. Always, I've taught it in depth and pretty much word by word. And every time I've taught it, I find new things. I, I want to live in all readiness regarding God and His Word. I would like Him to see me as being more noble in this way. And I'm not in competition with anyone else more noble, let's say, than I was before. Not more noble than you or somebody else. I mean, let's just pause right for a second there. We, we've had a lot of strife, heck, on Facebook today because people disagreed. Um, and 
oh my my goodness people disagree you know but but um this past weekend we had some strife there's a good chance in our town on friday there will be because it's a holiday um and people are going to have a little protest for that uh commemorating that we're going to get people all unsettled and and um A big part of, of what has happened is that people of different economic levels, people of different education levels, we actually saw today, uh, someone said that if you speak in big words, you're racist because many people of color don't have access to education. So having a good vocabulary makes you racist. Um, it could be finances, it could be skin color, it could, whatever. Satan always wants to divide people up, and often he'll have, he'll use jealousy to accomplish that. And jealousy has to do with coveting one another's stuff, or one another's things, or one another's situations of one another's people or one another's and it always has to do with comparing uh, I look at what I have I look at what you have I get jealous of what you have I compare myself to you then suddenly I have to do something because I feel bad and it was all because I compared myself to someone else I want to be more noble, but not more noble than someone else. I'm in competition with this, with me. And so, so, um, I want to be, I want God to see me as being more noble, that I will be in all readiness to receive. I will receive the word of God with all readiness. I will search the scriptures. He says, these are, far, are more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, the Jewish people in the synagogue who received Paul and Silas in Berea. They were more noble, fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. I think some versions say noble-minded in that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things that Paul and Silas were saying were so. Imagine that. These people cared so much about God and God's word that when Paul and Silas showed up in their synagogue teaching things they had never heard before, they actually searched the Old Testament to make sure they were teaching the truth to them. I've sat in worship service many times and if witness, whoever it was speaking, misquote a verse or outright teach something that wasn't true, I don't mind that happening. You know, we're all humans and we can make mistakes. I'm positive I've made mistakes while teaching or speaking on a stage in a building someplace. In my house, which is a building someplace. So I don't mind if that happens because we're humans and we make mistakes. What is distressing is when it's obvious that no one is listening with an ear for the truth because no one even looks up. And usually no one questions it at all. Now some of this is because the current format of the institution of church practically forbids the interruption of a lecturer, although I have seen that happen. Um, it was really amazing to watch it happen. In a more informal setting, for instance, sitting around a dining room table or in a small group like what Jesus and the disciples in the first century practiced. You have, you, you, um, in those circumstances, hey Mike, hey Donna, um, there's more of a chance that people will stop and interrupt them. And, um, um, make a note to myself because I missed the word. Um, 
In both cases, though, most often nobody even notices the errors. It's like many Christians have their personal fact checkers turned off in their souls. They just don't. It's just like we go on autopilot. Um, I've done it. I've gone on autopilot, and we're just going through it. And we're sitting there like a bunch of guppies, just opening and closing our mouths. And we're not listening, not actively. I once watched a preacher purposely skip over several verses in Romans 8 just because the verses mentioned an act of Holy Spirit. His splinter of the church, his, his denomination, overacts to the excesses of some charismatics by virtually ignoring what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit of God. That's how they handle it. It's a scary topic for them. So they just skip over it. And so he just read the chapter, Romans chapter 8, and it's two or three verses that talk about the Holy Spirit actively living in the spirits of humans. And this guy just read the chapter as if those verses weren't in the Bible at all. Now, I was a fairly new Christian. I was probably um, three years old as a Christian. No one objected. No one even seemed to notice. I mean, I remember looking around, holding my finger on the verse, and he skipped over it. I mean, it was so smooth. It couldn't have been a mistake. And it was, it was too conspicuous. So after the service, after all the handshaking and hi, way to go, brothers, is all done, he was heading back to the parsonage, and I chased him down. And I tried to beat him to the gate, you know, and catch up with him. I call out his name. I chased him down. And I said, I said, um, did you notice that you skipped over these verses? No, I read every verse in Romans 8. You should listen to the recording because you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. I said, no, you didn't. Why did you skip over those verses? I didn't. So I just cut to the chase and I said, I said, um, do you or do you not believe that the Holy Spirit of God literally indwells a Christian like Romans 8, whatever the verse is, says, and he wouldn't discuss it. He had taken a stance and had decided to be silent where the scripture spoke. And the Bible says, don't add or take any words from this book or your name will be removed from the book of life. Not sure what all that means. It sure sounds bad, though. No one objected. They weren't paying attention. They weren't studying the word as they went along. The man who led me to Jesus once preached an entire sermon on a Sunday morning in a church that loves God's word so much that at times it looks like it worships the Bible. Every time he quoted a verse, he would give the reference. Because in that style of church, he had to pretty much prove everything he said. Each time he quoted it, it was from a non-existent book of the Bible. It wasn't even from the Apocrypha, the between first, the Old and New Testament books that um, King James left out. Um, no one said anything. No one noticed. No one pulled him aside after the service to even ask him about it. They weren't actively, readily studying the Word of God. That evening in his teaching, he told everybody what it had been done, what he had done. It was very convicting, even for brand new Christians. Why don't Christians notice these things? I prayed about it a number of times, and the term that comes to me is spirit of stupor, S-T-U-P-O-R. Now spirit of stupor isn't an attitude of stupor or sleepiness. It is a demon that gets assigned or dispatched. It's a very sobering thing. And I found it in the Bible, in Romans 11, 8. Just as it's written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. So 
the people he's talking about, Romans 8, it refers to Jewish people who had rejected Jesus. I wonder sometimes if God has allowed so many Christians to have this spirit of stupor, or in the King James, the spirit of slumber, because they really aren't interested in his word. So much of what's practiced in the name of God today is nowhere to be found in the Bible, yet not many Christians seem to care about that. Despite verses like this in Proverbs 30, verse 6, do not add to God's words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. On, on Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you, nor take it, Take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. In Revelations 22, 18 to 19, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away from his part his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in the book. So much has been added to Christian worship, to gathering, to Christian identity, and everyday living, and so much has been taken away, often in the name of man-made traditions. And it happened in Jesus' time, too, with the Jews. In Mark 7, verse 13, it says this. He, Jesus, said to them, the Pharisees and the scribes, all too well you reject the commandment of God so that you might keep your tradition. Mark 7, 9. And then in Mark 7, 13, he continues his thought, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you've handed down, and many such things that you do. That's right there in the Word of God. You reject the commandments of God, basically, for the sake of your man-made traditions. And you make the Word of God of no effect through your tradition that you keep handing down. Read which one, Mike? Um, Mark 7 or Revelations? Mark 7. Okay, <clears throat> before Mark 7... Uh, um, he's asking me to read the verses again about don't add a takeaway. I'll give you the scriptures if you're writing them down. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Revelations 22, verse 18 and 19. There's some pretty good, there's no lag today, so I'm getting a lot of response. It's like instantaneously. So it looks like we're doing good working here out of my office at the safe place. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Do not add to God's words, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Deuteronomy 4, 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. In Revelations 22, verse 18 and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. And then then we talked about how much, so much has been added to Christian worship. Hey, Joan Bain from New Zealand. So much has been added to Christian worship, Christian gathering, Christian identity, and everyday living for Christians. And so much has been taken away, often in the name of man-made traditions. And Jesus spoke to the Jewish leaders about man-made traditions. In Mark 7, 9, he says, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. You reject God's commandment so that you can do your, your man-made traditions. 
And in Mark 7, 13, he says, going on, this is making the word of God of no effect. It, it takes the power away from the word of God through your tradition, which you've handed down in many things you do. It's like taking life and having some of it filtered away, and the filter's called man-made tradition. I, I really don't like doing many things just because they're tradition, you know? This sort of sin was apparently not a part of how the Jews in Berea operated. They were respectful of God, and they were interested in what his word said. So we took such a big detour <coughs> that we're going to go back and look at Acts 17, 10, and 11 again. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away from, from talking about away from Thessalonica, away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue, the, the group of, of the Jews, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Luke could see that their attitude and their respect for God's word were connected to what he says next, what happens next. So remember, they're respecting God's word. They're reading it. Uh, when they get an idea like this from Paul that Jesus might be the long-awaited Messiah, they're checking it to the scripture. They're receiving it with readiness. Um, it's very cool. Um, so they're scrutinizing the word. They have a, not a critical mind, but um, and that they're not being critical, but they're listening critically to see, is this really true? That leads to what happens in verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed. And also, not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as the men. Because they were like this, because they had this love and respect for God's word that seems like it's been lost in a lot of ways in the modern body of Christ, many of them believed. You know, I wonder sometimes how many people in the buildings, and, and that includes house churches, weren't born again. But they think they're Christians because they go to church. I mean, I, I, I was um, helping a congregation out once, and I was asked to scrutinize people to see if they would be uh, experienced enough to take part in some of the deeper ministry of the church. And I asked them to tell me their salvation story. They were good, upstanding people. They were honest. They were at the building all the time. They helped out. They were servants. They were, they were great. <clears throat> neither of them had ever confessed Jesus as their Lord. And it was assumed because they gave, because they served, because they showed up, that they were born again. I wonder how many people go their whole lives in those buildings and never receive Jesus as their Lord. Maybe because of man-made traditions that seem to be much more important than obeying God's word because we talk about the traditions a lot and we don't talk a whole lot about what God says. Because they were like this, many of them believed. And this is different than we've seen in other towns in which just some believed. Here in this town, many have believed. It seems to me that God is in the business of, of confronting ideas, beliefs, habits, and identities that are entertained by Christians and often lost people um, that don't coincide with what he thinks about those things. I'll say it again. It seems to me that God is in the business of confronting ideas, beliefs, and habits and identities that are entertained by people, but these ideas, beliefs, habits, and identities don't coincide with what God thinks about them. And he disagrees because these are wrong ideas. But many proponents of these church styles stress that they're right. And then all the other styles, man-made tweaks to God's ways are wrong. But ours is right. The rest of those aren't. That's why you're so fortunate to be in just the right place.
you know. Never in my life have I accidentally landed in just the right place. I get steered like everybody else does by Satan to what's easiest, what's most comfortable, what makes sense to me. And sometimes what God has for us isn't going to make that much sense to us. Acts 17.11 again. These were more fair-minded than those in this and like that they received the word with all readiness. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. When church leaders and other people have decided that how they believe and what they do is perfect, this haughty attitude tends to breed close-minded people, people who are not in all readiness, people who think they're completely correct in all matters of, matters of doctrine. And this does not make for teachable people. Jesus is trying to sanctify his bride, and all too often his bride is resistant to change because of pride. In contrast, humility dictates that we are all wrong about something. Even scriptural things. I'll tell people, I don't know what I'm wrong about. I know I'm wrong about something. And eventually, God will lead me to the correct understanding of that, often through some other person. Humility dictates that we're all wrong about something, even scriptural things, and we should present ourselves to the Lord for his correction. Then, he could turn our worlds upside down. Then we might be free, healed, whole, and filled with joy. Often in small intimate gatherings of the church where people are free to ask questions. That's one of my favorite things. Why do we do it this way? Why did it say that? Why was this? Why was that? Often in small intimate gatherings of the church where people are free to ask questions, we get Berean, we experience Berean moments, sometimes Berean hours. It's not uncommon during discussions for someone to keep asking where what we said was to be found in the Word. And this leads us all on a romp through the Scriptures. And this seems to almost be a lost art in the body of Christ in some places. And that's sad. We need a good shot of the Bereans in us all. I mean, think about it. If, if the primary way that people are taught, whether in Bible study or in a sermon, is a lecture format, you can't interrupt. It's socially wrong. It's set up to be that way. That's one of the reasons that the speaker stands above, looking down at whoever they're speaking. It just You just don't tend to ask. <clears throat> now, I have seen, you know, I have seen that. I've had people ask me questions when I was on a roll in the middle of a teaching. And that's great. It doesn't bother me at all. And there are a lot of ministers that are like that, you know, to be fair and honest. But there's a lot. I mean, I actually heard um, people interrupt and they tell them to shut up. And I, I don't think I'll be doing that. Now, I'll close in saying that I was speaking in a raised platform behind a pulpit right down the road from here uh, at this congregation um, that later had a Baker building. And there was a beef <clears throat> between a young man and his wife's um, father and mother. And the father came in and interrupted what everybody was experiencing. And I told him to please leave and talk to the police about whatever it was. Um, not because he was interrupting me, but he was he was disturbing everything. And he did it on purpose to try to hurt this young couple. It, it mortified the young lady. It had angered her husband. And um, I'm, I'm just happy he didn't get himself thrown out because there were a couple of people looking at me like, do you want me to kick him out? I didn't want him kicked out of church. 
I just wanted him to quit bugging everybody that was there. That wasn't a welcome uh, fact-finding um, interruption. Well, all right, it is 8 o'clock Central Standard Time in the PM. Um, appreciate everybody coming. Uh, pray for um, pray for the USA right now. There's a number of people that are trying to take advantage out of one man's crime to somehow even further divide the body of Christ and divide the country um, by race, by all kinds of stuff. So if you would pray for our country, I'd appreciate it. And, um, and for cooler heads to prevail. And then we have another protest, another protest um, this week on Friday sometime. <coughs> and hopefully that'll be a um, peaceful one too. This last one su Sunday was too. So I hope so. And I hope nobody does any provoking and we all act like adults and not like arrested adolescents. Um, so let's pray. So Father, I ask you to bless bless us, and bless your body. I ask you to give us all uh, hearts, Berean hearts, to where we uh, search scriptures as you confront us through people and directly and through what we read in the scripture or just dreams or however you do it, that you give us that Berean mindset of going to the scripture and let the scripture speak to us to not try to squish it into our multiple a multitude of pigeonholes where we try to make your word say what we want it to say. I ask you to bless us. I ask you to uh, continue to bless us. I ask you to be with all those who are here tonight. I ask you to be with those who want to come and couldn't. I ask you to be with those who don't like us and don't want to be a part of us. I ask you to be with anybody that views these over our YouTube or through the website. And I thank you for these things. And I praise you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'll see you guys later. I love y'all. See you next week, I hope. And maybe see you on Facebook here and there. And I thank you for that. Bye-bye.